Now, uh, just to talk about the castles, in relation to the river, first of all, we have Terrylang Castle. And the castles of the city and of the river area were all based very close, just on the shores of the actual Corrib. Now, the Corrib really is divided between the Galway River. The Galway River extends from the mud dock and right up along Walk and then up as far as the Fisheries Tower and a little bit beyond that, beyond the Wolf Tone Bridge. Then it becomes the Corrib after the Queen's Gap. The Queen's Gap is an area of the river. Uh, the salmon and the trout, a tax on those was paid to Queen Elizabeth and she had the right to the, the proceeds from the fisheries there. So the Queen's River or the Queen's Gap, then you have the, uh, the, the first of the, of, of the bigger bridges. You have the, um, the Salmon Weir Bridge and the new bridge, which Colum, my colleague, is going to be talking about later on. Also on the river, you had uh, O'Brien's Bridge. Now, O'Brien's Bridge is the site of a much earlier bridge uh, called the Great Bridge, and that was fortified at both ends, uh, more or less to keep the native Irish out. And uh, even in the 17th century, it was refortified, and bastions were put at either end. And if you ever get into the basement of the Galway Arms pub there, for instance, part of the bastion, uh, which defended the Great Bridge, is, uh, was excavated there. Now, all of these bridges are visible on the pictorial map. One of the other, uh, the pictorial map is normally dated to the 1650s, but it actually probably dates to the 1660s, and it, it gives a bird's eye view of the city. By the 19th century, several more bridges were added, and in the exhibition that you see around the walls, which Colm O'Reardon has put up, you'll see down at the corner, you'll see some of the waterways of Galway, as they were uh, between the 1820s and the 1840s. And, uh, you know, many of these were built in um, a very short time, and they're part of the industrial heritage and the archaeology of the city. And right beside Terryland Castle, for instance, we have the old Terryland Waterworks, uh, which was built in 1895 on the site of an earlier building. We also have, beside Terryland Waterworks, you have the 1950s Waterworks, and you also have an electric ge generating plant dating from the 1830s. So there's plenty of industrial archaeology there. But just to return to the castle, the castle itself, it's often referred to as uh, Tirilon, um, the, uh, the land of the castle. Sometimes it's referred to as Old Castle. A lot of the Galwegians, native Galwegians, will refer to it as Old Castle. And sometimes it's referred to as um, um, Burke's Castle or Clan Rickard Castle. So it's named these various with, with these various titles and various documents, but most people still call it Terryland or Old Castle. Now, Old Castle and New Castle, the reason that you distinguish, uh, the reason that it was given that name, uh, Old Castle, was to distinguish it from a castle, the, rem the remnants of which are in the grounds of NUI Galway. And that was the New Castle. If you look from the James Hardiman Library into the car park there, you'll see a circular turret and part of the bone wall of the New Castle. And New Castle, of course, gives its name to the area. Now, to return to Old Castle. Old Castle, as you see it now, is a 17th century building. But there's a hillock quite close to it at the back where you see the curve of the river. And on that hillock, we believe there is the earlier tower house. We know that because as part of the project, we got a lot of restitivity and ground probing radar done as part of the Tree Castles project. So just you see the curve of the river there, the back. Yeah, just there. Well, in from that, in about 400 meters, 
there's a, a mound there which we believe to be the site of a tower house. As I said, this section of the castle here, as you see it, is mainly 17th century. Um, and you have beautiful, typical 17th century chimney. It's only when you get up close to that that you realize that that was originally picked out in charcoal and in white uh, mortar. And there was a, a sort of a, a pattern of squares and lozenges picked out on the chimney, and they're still there. Now, that's been give or, given a weather sheeting in order to preserve that, that pattern in the mortar. So what they were trying to do is they were trying to show that this was a high status building and that the building, that the chimney was all uh, made of cut stone ashlar. And what they did was they mixed in charcoal with the, the mortar to show the lines, uh, the grooves between the stones. So they were claiming high status for the building. Um, so that's Terryland. One of the main things there at Terryland was to try and make it safe as possible. And uh, there was scaffolding up on that for a considerable amount of time. We still have the fencing around the sites and we have the, the fencing around um, Menlo. Uh, people are always saying the fencing is ugly, but we, we absolutely have to have the fencing there while it's a working site uh, from the point of view of health and safety and insurance and so on. There's the curve of the river. Um, this area of the river, just here with the trees on it, that's Jordan's Island, which is referred to earlier on by Mick. Between Jordan's Island and, and Wood Quay, vast number of archaeological artifacts have been found between the 1980s and right up to the present time. In the 1980s, uh, the legislation was quite different and there was a considerable amount of uh, diving on the coral. What was recovered included Mesolithic Middle Stone Age lithics. You had Bronze Age spearheads. You had uh, stone axes of the Neolithic. You also had a couple of rapiers, a considerable number of swords, one Iron Age sword in its scabbard. You had muskets, parts of a wheel lock, various types of, uh, of weaponry. Uh, and then you also had everything from clay pipes to pottery jars to ink wells, uh, pottery of all descriptions and all dates. For many years, people often said, well, you know, why isn't it available in Galway? Well, it is available in Galway because a considerable collection of it is on display in Galway City Museum. And in fact, one of the biggest tranches of archaeological artifacts that has been given out by the National Museum to a local museum has been given to Galway City Museum. For the National Museum to lend artifacts, the museum must be a designated museum. And Galway City Museum has achieved that status. Uh, the castle at uh, Terryland uh, was burnt in 1691 during the Williamite Wars. There was a description of its burning. There was a battle in the, um, in the orchard of the Earl of Clan Rickard, which is at this castle. Uh, the Irish and the French who held the castle decided to retreat to Galway. Uh, they were unable to hold it, so they burnt the castle and it was never rebuilt since. During the conservation work, the slates, the melted lead, and the ridge tiles, the pottery ridge tiles from the roof, all of these, fragments of all of these, were found during the consolidation work in the, in the upper parts of the walls. So there's quite a lot of evidence of the, of the burning of it. And there was also things like lead cames, uh, cames which held little diamond-shaped pieces of glass and these would have been housed in the in the windows that you see there. There, uh, th these are the typical 17th century hood molded windows, and they would have had mullions running through them, and a casement and diamond sheets of glass in in those held within the lead. This is Menlo Castle, 
and uh, it needs quite a considerable amount of consolidation. Menlo Castle is of many phases. You have a 15th century phase, 15th or early 16th century tower house. You have a big 17th century long house attached to it. Then in the 18th century, there are various modifications and a little uh, turret was added at one, a belvedere, an ornamental uh, belvedere was added. And in the 19th century, numerous other changes took place as well. Now, we know a considerable amount about the history of Menlo Castle because one of the people who lived there was Martin J. Blake, and he published uh, a whole series of papers on the Blake family records, and he published two volumes of the Blake family records uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, what you see there is uh, a little bartisan machicolation, really, and in the machicolation, you have very flat red brick, probably some of the among the earliest brick used in Ireland. Uh, sometimes it was used in bake ovens from around the um, from the 16th century onwards. Uh, then you had large houses, Jigginstown House, whatever, built completely of bricks. Um, this section uh, seems to date to around 1610 or 1616, and the bricks were used ornamentally. And they would have contrasted, the very orangey red color of the bricks would have contrasted against the mortar, and the mortar would have been uh, a bright white render. Um, so that's the front view, the main, the main view of the house. So you have your big 17th century ornamental, they're not really crenellations in the sense that they're not military, they're more yeah. ornamental than that. You get these sort of things uh, at Portumna Castle and many other 17th century houses in Ireland. There would have been a rim of moulded stone around these, and we hope that during the conservation work, when we sort through the stone, uh, that we'd be able to find those and, and put them back. Um, as I said, the house was burnt in 1910 in a, in a tragic fire. One of the Blakes died in the fire and there's an obelisk erected to uh, the woman in the grounds of the castle, although none of her remains were actually discovered. Um, so it was lived in uh, until 1910. One of the servants who jumped from the, the castle died and another servant survived and went on to Menlo Park, where an awful lot of the people from Menlo Village went to in America. And it, it's famous now for high tech and so on, but Menlo Park is the play, one of the places that they went to. Uh, so this is mainly a 17th century frontage with an 18th or early 19th century Georgian doorway here. Much of the doorway has been robbed out, but we're hoping that we'll find the architectural fragments. And if we don't find them, we'll cut uh, matching uh, pieces. There was a porch here, and there was a big 17th century doorway with caryatids on it. That's a, that doorway is now in um, Ashford Castle. It has been reused there. Uh, the side of the gable here would have been covered in uh, slate sheeting, and that was a feature in the 18th century, in particular in Galway, and a lot of the big 18th century houses down in Dominic Street were originally slated with sheet as weather sheeting on the on the side of the building. Uh, uh, unfortunately, one of the things, one of the problems that arose when the ivy had to be taken off was that enough of the, the, the slate sheeting became loose, but that has to be put back eventually. Uh, there's another view of it, and you can see the ornamental little turret up here, the little belvedere that was added uh, instead of a it's almost like a little Victorian folly. Most of this part was rebuilt or, or, or reconstructed. In the 18th century, when you had larger sash windows were, were introduced, but they still retained the old idea of the, of the, of the 17th century window by, by in, including uh, mullions and transoms in the window in, in, in places. Uh, this is the, the entrance to the castle, uh, the, the gate lodge. 
this wasn't funded by the community monuments fund this was from an earlier fund this was funded with um with, solely with the uh, funding from the heritage council and uh, so that was done in uh, uh 2014. the interesting thing about the gate lodge is that uh, well there was a gate lodge at the back of this building and there was a uh, there was a double a double gate here but this turret here um it has connotations added to it but it, it looks to me like uh, a late medieval turret and there are several of these on the grounds of the castle and they uh, there were turrets on the on the line of the Vaughan wall which surrounded the original castle at Menlo. Um, other features you have a pair of gargoyles which were taken from an earlier building probably taken from Galway and inserted in there in the 19th century when when that section of gateway was added to the earlier turret. Uh, an interesting fact about the gargoyles is the gargoyles are commonest in Galway than anywhere else in the country. You have the biggest number of gargoyles in Galway city than you have anywhere in Ireland. Uh, and some of the best examples, of course, are on St. Nicholas's Collegiate Church and on Lynch's Castle. The ones on Lynch's Castle date around 1502, around that. Uh, the ones on uh, St. Nicholas's Church are, are, are 16th century. They belong to an extension onto the south aisle of the church. There is a view, another view of Menlo, and it shows two things. It shows the 17th century mock battlements of connellations with fancy sort of uh, features. And then it also shows that these have been added on to the existing tower house. The tower house is of typical of late 15th or early 16th century type. And the windows then have been enlarged. The originally were slit windows of, of this nature here. Uh, apart from the building at Menlo, the main building, there's also the uh, the the um, the stable block. Um, one of my first uh, jobs as heritage officer in 1999, I had to go out with um, Christy Kelly, our technician. And we had to take a lump of the scraw, cut a lump of the scraw between the stable block and the castle and another at the castle. We had to label it and put it into a padded envelope, seal it with the corporation seal and send it to the um, our law agent. We were taking official uh, possession of Menlo Castle. <laughs> so somewhere there is a rotting a padded bag somewhere in some solicitor's office. And I'm sure that the insect evidence or whatever would be of, of interest at some stage to some osteoarchaeologist or, or, or a paleoarchaeologist as well, because there was lots of scraw and weeds and scrub in it. This is the tower house at Dewishka, and this is some of the conservation work that was done. You can see what has been spliced in. You can see that the mullions were missing, but they have been put back in. There is the tower house at Dewishka. We hope eventually, as part of the scheme, as part of the Tree Castles project, to put a roof on that it would be an awful disgrace not to. Entrance to the tower house was by way of what's called, well, there was, first of all, there was a soft house, a building out here. You can see it there. You can see the line of the gable there. But there was also a machicolation here. The machicolation projected out. There was little defensive projection. And it projected, the, it projected over the doorway. The doorway then has a groove in, this, in the edges of it. And that contained what's called a yet. And uh, so if anybody's trying to get into the castle, it's a way of saying, not yet. <laughs> Stand back, identify yourself. What the yet was, was a steel frame. And it was attached to a series of chains. And the chains were went in through holes in the castle wall. Uh, so the yet was a protective frame. Uh, it was like uh, drawn up tight over the doorway. The door itself might have been a couple of inches, six inches of oak. 
And then once you got into the barn wall up here, by the time you had uh, destroyed the steel yet, by the time you had burnt your way through the, um, the six inches of oak in the door, and by the time you were just entering into the castle, you'd have somebody above you shouting, surprise. <laughs> now, they probably didn't boil up tar or, or, or throw down stones or whatever, but they probably did use the machicolation here and the murder hole inside to try to spear you before you got anywhere further in the castle. But I think sometimes in, in these instances, uh, discretion was probably the best, best, better part of valor because, I mean, there were two barn walls. There was one barn wall here, and there was another barn wall further out. And if they, if they had managed to get through those, you know, I think you'd probably be panicking rather than hanging around to attempt to skewer the, uh, the invader through the, the murder hole. So um, that's just with the uh, the slides. I just want to give you the background in, in a way, briefly, very briefly, to how this is all funded. Uh, in 2014, we did a conservation plan for the three castles. Now, conservation plans were originally brought to Ireland. The whole concept was brought from Australia. English Heritage adopted them. Uh, the Heritage Council brought the concept and developed it and paid for an awful lot of the early, um, early plans. And it was, it was gradually, it became apparent that it wasn't just a conservation plan that was needed. It was also an awful lot of consultation with everybody interested and involved. So these became conservation and management plans. And as I said, the Heritage Council funded an awful lot of them. An awful lot of them now are being done by individual archaeologists, plus individual conservation architects, plus ecologists, and so on. So a plan had to be drawn up before anything could be done on the castles. We had to ensure that the built cultural and natural heritage of the, the castles was, was preserved, maintained. We had to ensure that an archaeologist was employed, conservation architect, conservation structural engineer, uh, an ecologist as well to ensure that there were no bat roosts, bird uh, habitats, ha uh, rare, rare species or whatever. So all that process has to be gone through. So in 2014, as I said, uh, the conservation management plan was done. It had always been in the heritage plan as an action of the heritage plan uh, since 1999. But eventually uh, the councillors voted uh, 100,000 per year for five years for the Castles project. So before it could get up and running, uh, they took back 100,000 and spent it on something else. <laughs> but then eventually the, con uh, the Community Monuments Fund came into play. So we're now using the Community Monuments Fund, which is the Department of uh, Housing, Log Government and Heritage Fund. It comes from the National Monument Service. We're, we're using that in conjunction with the money that is that that was voted by the councillors, and all of this is against the background of where it was planned originally, and it was planned originally in the uh, heritage plan, and it was always planned as an action of the heritage plan. So eventually, uh, some actions get. Uh, worked on uh, quicker than others, but eventually, anyway, uh, the, the Castles project are underway. We estimate that we'll probably be still applying for um, community monuments funds for at least the next five years before we have the castles uh, conserved to a state where the public can come in and in enjoy and view them. Uh, we also have a local area plan uh, for the castles and uh, we are developing say walks around the castles and uh, making sure that everybody that there's universal access to what's what's there so that's really uh, by way of an update um, 
as I say, Terrellane Castle, Menlo Castle, they defended the way in from Galway by river. Uh, they were always important. They were important socially, historically, militarily. They're still as just as important artistically, culturally, and from the point of view of people's enjoyment of their fabric, their natural uh, built and cultural fabric. So thank you very much.